I want to talk this evening a combination of talk on the coming again of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of heaven, and the judgment of God. I want to take tonight the second chapter of the first chapter of Acts, beginning with verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they stood steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, two angels, which also said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus is going to come again. Now, we're living in a totally different era and a different world than that which Jesus and the disciples lived. This has been called the information age, and we're living at a time of information overload. You and I have access to more information, data, facts, news, and knowledge than anybody in the history of the world. Information is doubling. Notice this, information is doubling every five years. I'd hate to be starting to school today and have to have everything doubled in five years. The average family tunes into the news on television when they get up in the morning. While eating breakfast, we quickly check the newspaper. All day, we are bombarded with news on radio and television. We come home and immediately play back the telephone answering machine. I don't have one. When we're ready to go to bed, we tune in to the latest news. Our lives are becoming a frenzy of facts. New computers are coming out that give us more information at faster and faster rates. Do you know how many new books are published every year just in the United States? 60,000 new books every year. Americans make up one and a half billion telephone calls every day. A billion and a half calls a day we make in America alone. A copy of the New York Times contains more information than people would have had in a lifetime in the 17th century, England. Can you imagine that? How little they knew compared to what we have access to today. We are buried under a mountain of information. We forget up to 80% of it within 24 hours. And look at the time we spend getting all that information poured into us. Most of it is irrelevant to our eternal destiny. What we must know is how to end up in the right place in the next life. We don't hear much about the next life on the newscast and the television. And yet we're going to spend all eternity in the next life. The little boy said, it seems to me that we're going to be dead a whole lot longer than we're going to be alive and how little time we spend preparing for the next life, how little time we think about what is coming. There's only one book that can help us about the future life, and that's the Bible. You see, the death rate in our country, in spite of all this information, the death rate is still high. Do you know what it is? 100%. That's the death rate. And there are two options before you. You can earn your way by a perfect performance while you're here. You can bat a hunt a thousand and never make an error in your whole life. But anyone trying to perform their way into heaven is wasting their time. You're not saved by your goodness nor your works. 
that comes following your salvation in obedience to him and we all should do it i'm so thrilled at what this committee has decided to do with extra money that they may have to help in the habitat program and leave a legacy if you're trying to earn your way to heaven by living a perfect life you can't do it why because the bible says that sin keeps us out of heaven it separates us from God and sin is a transgression of the law and then the Bible says if you break one of the commandments you've broken them all so you and I have broken all the Ten Commandments and we're guilty before God just that one lie that you told could disqualify you from heaven you see God is a holy God he's a just God and he cannot lower the standard and accept the law batting average you'd have to reach a thousand and nobody that's ever lived has reached a thousand except one and that was the Lord Jesus Christ and that's why God sent his son to this earth he lived a sinless and righteous life and under the second option Jesus transfers all the errors all the sins off of us onto his own shoulders into his own heart and when he died on the cross he wasn't dying because he had to he wasn't dying for himself he was dying in your place he had your sins and my sins on him and Jesus transfers his perfect righteousness to us and we become clothed in the righteousness of God so that when God looks at us he doesn't see our sins he sees the blood that was shed on the cross and he knows that he has forgiven us you're now acceptable in God's sight just as though you'd never sinned that's what justification means just as if you had never sinned we become his child you become adopted into his family you become a child of God you're a child of the king a new relationship has been established the Bible also teaches that God is a God of judgment he's going to judge the world in Revelation 20 it says and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place in them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell del delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to his works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found notice this whosoever that's you or me whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire is your name written in that book I don't think I would leave this stadium today unless I knew that my name was written in that Lamb's Book of Life. Two sets of books. The moment you're born, your name is written in the books and an account is kept there. All your thoughts, all your intents, everything you've ever done, said, or thought is in the books. And what is there condemns you because God's great tape recorder has been running the whole time and it's all there but when you come to Christ when you repent of your sins and you receive him by faith as Lord and Savior he transfers your name from the books to the book of life you're forgiven you're going to heaven your name is already recorded to be in heaven for eternity you see the wicked the wicked dead the Bible says will seek a hiding place 
from the face of Christ, the judge, and there's no hiding place. Dead, small, and great will stand before God, and there's none that doeth good, no, not one. Not one of us is good enough. The book of life will be opened, and the wicked will be shown that God in his mercy provided space for you in the book of life. There's space for you there. But you never took advantage of it. So in Romans 1, it says you're without excuse. You may come and bring all your excuses and say, God, I didn't mean to do that. Lord, you've got this wrong. But the Bible says there'll be no excuse. Now, God didn't even spare the angels. You see, there were some angels that sinned against God, Lucifer was the most beautiful and the most magnificent creature in all the universe. God created him. But he rebelled against God in some unknown way that we hear, read about it in several places in Scripture. And many angels rebelled with him. And they were judged. And God didn't spare them. And then God spared not the world in which Noah lived. Second Peter 2, 5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Noah was 600 years old. He preached repentance everywhere. He called upon people to repent of their sins, but they didn't listen. Methuselah was 969 years, and his name means it shall be sent. God was not going to send the flood until Methuselah died. The day that Methuselah died is the day the flood began. And in Genesis 6, there's the appalling conditions are summed up in a few terrible words of how the people lived. They were wicked. They had evil imaginations. They were corrupt. They were violent. Every imagination of man's thoughts were evil, the scripture says. Christ said, as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Bible says that's going to happen again. When men are going to live, men and women are going to live that way. Could it be that we're approaching that moment now? Read our newspapers every day. All the violence and the evil imaginations. I had a film producer once tell me in California that he and his staff spent their time trying to think up new ways for people to get kicks out of their sex life. Christ said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And it says that by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark. Do you fear the Lord? I do. I have a reverential fear, but I also fear His judgment. Because the judgment of God is going to be worldwide and it's going to be throughout the human race and it's going to take us all in if we don't know Christ. The only thing that's going to spare you from that great white throne judgment is are you in Christ? Do you know him? Have you surrendered your life to him? Now God spared, he didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot had gone to that city. He was going to be a witness in that city. He was going to try to live a righteous life in that city. But the people ignored him when he talked about God. They persisted in their sins and their perversions and their godlessness. And God judged Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them. The Bible says in Hebrews, God is a consuming fire. Lot lived in the middle of that evil. We know that he was forced 
to hear and see many things that tortured his soul. Years ago, we would have been shocked at a lot of the things that we now accept as a matter of course. I, I often think of my father and mother who are in their graves. Godly people would never think of even looking at some of the things today that we watch. And it floods our imaginations with evil thoughts. But Lot lived in the middle of every kind of terrible vice and evil, yet he escaped it. He was never distracted from the right course. And when the worst came to worst, Lot was willing to make a clean break with his environment and to leave it forever. When God called him out of Sodom, are you willing to make a clean break with sin and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned and I'm willing to turn from sin. I'm willing to be a changed person from this moment on. But Lord, I can't do it. If you'll help me, I'll try. And God spared not his own son. God loved his son. But when the sins of the world were taken on him at the cross, God did not spare him that terrible judgment because the cross is a judgment. It's your judgment and my judgment. And Jesus took it for us. Isaiah said he was smitten of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. God spared not even his son. Do you think he's going to spare you? or me, if we persist to live apart from him and don't surrender our lives and our hearts to him. And then God will not spare you in the day of judgment. In Isaiah 66, it tells us that the Lord is coming with fiery chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger and fury. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him take his stand. Will you be on the Lord's side? Yes, the coming again of Christ is mentioned over 300 times. But in the midst of judgment, God is also a God of love and mercy. And God loves you. And we've seen expressions of love here this week that have caused tears to roll down our cheeks. I've seen many a black person and white person in each other's arms down here as they've come forward to receive Christ. And we called it the spirit of Atlanta. When black and white will live together with joy and peace and look after the poor and the hungry and the naked and the homeless. These are the things that God expects of us as believers, and we are to do it together. And we ought to worship together and pray together. Regardless of the color of our skin, we are believers in Christ. And Jesus, told his disciples to watch for certain signs of his coming. And everywhere I look, I see the signs. You know, there's an inscription in the dome of our capital in Washington that most people don't know is there. It says this, one far off divine event toward which the whole of creation moves. That's all it says. One far off divine event toward which the whole of creation moves. When the dome was erected, some God-fearing official apparently ordered that inscription to be etched in the dome of our seat of government because we are moving towards some far off event and it may not be so far off. That event, is the coming of peace to the world when the Prince of Peace returns. 
and I'm looking forward to his return. When will Christ come? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, said Jesus. We're not to speculate. We can only watch for signs, like you watch for the weather signs. How will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and with a shout and the voice of the archangel. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, I heard about a fishing vessel returning home after many days at sea. As they neared the shore, the sailors gazed toward the dock where a group of their loved ones had gathered. The skipper looked through his binoculars and identified some of them. He said, I see Bill's Mary, and there's Tom's Margaret, and there's David's Anne. One man became concerned because his wife was not there. Later, he left the boat with a heavy heart and hurried up the hill to the cottage, and he opened the door. She ran to meet him, saying, I've been waiting for you. He replied, yes but the other men's wives were watching for them. We're told in Scripture that we're to watch as well as wait, and we're to be prepared, be ye ready, for in such an hour as ye know not, the Son of Man cometh. Do you think he's going to come tonight? Are you ready? You know, the Bible teaches it's appointed unto man once to die. You are going to die. I am going to die. And after that, there'll be the judgment. Dwight L. Moody, the great preacher in Chicago and the great evangelist, was speaking to a crowd of men. He had about 10,000 men in front of him, and he preached on how important it was to make a commitment to Christ now while you have time. And he gave the invitation this way. He said, all of you that will say to Christ, I will receive you, I will follow you, stand up and say, I will. If you're going to make a decision that you're not going to make that, do that, I want you to stand up and say, I won't. And so all over the audience, people said, I will, I won't. I will, I won't, I will, I won't. Which will it be for you? Because you see, God's patience is forever in one sense, but it runs out in another. If you keep rejecting and turning down or ignoring or paying no attention to your real need of Christ, you can go too far. There's a place in Niagara River called Red Beyond Redemption's Point. I've been there. There's a place where you can swim or you can float, but if you go past that point, there's no hope for you. The waters begin to swirl, and it has taken many a man and woman down who thought they could do it. And there are many of us that think we'll get by with it for a few more, oh, give me a few more months, a few more years. I just am having such a wonderful time here. And Lord, I, I want to follow you, I really do. But I just can't pay the price now. It's just too high. Oh yes, you're a member of the church. You've been baptized or you've been confirmed and all that is fine. But deep down inside, you are not sure that your name is written on that book. Jesus said, you must be born again. And he said that to the most religious man in the New Testament. I had a bishop of one of our great denominations ask if I would come and see him. And I went to see him and 
he locked the door. And he called me Mr. Graham. He said, Mr. Graham, you're going to be shocked. I've been through the seminaries. I have my PhD degree in theology. I'm a bishop of this church. And then tears began to come down his cheeks, but he said, you know, I'm not sure that I'm saved. And I wanted to know if you would pray with me. And I explained to him in as simple language as I knew how to be saved, how to be sure, how to be certain. And I held out my hand and he gripped it. And he said, yes. We got on our knees and prayed, and afterward he said, I'm sure. I had the privilege of knowing very well, playing a lot of golf with him, talking with him, and so forth, Dwight Eisenhower when he was dying at Walter Reed Hospital. He invited me to come and see him and I went. And he told the nurses and the doctors to get out of the room. And they got out of the room and he reached up and his chilly, bony hand, he held mine and he said, Billy, he said, would you explain once more how you can be sure? I took my New Testament out, read him some passages of scripture of assurance, and he gripped my hand and he said, I'm sure. And when I walked out of there for the last time, with that great smile of his on his face and on those pillows, and a few weeks later I was in Jerusalem, sitting in the office of the foreign secretary and word came that Eisenhower had passed away. I wouldn't tell that story unless I had asked his wife and family if I could tell it. They, they, they were very happy for me to tell it because he wanted to be sure. And I think there's some people here now that want to be sure. You want to know before this crusade is ended, did you know it's going to be closed in a few minutes? And you may never have a moment like this as long as you live. Look at this crowd. When will you ever have a moment like this again? When God has spoken to your heart and the message has been proclaimed and God's love to you has been explained. He loves you so much he gave his son for you. He wants to come into your life and change your life and make you a new person and you'll be spared that awful judgment. And you can make that commitment right here now, today. Men, women, young people from all over the stadium, you up in the balcony, down here on the floor, wherever, I want you to come and stand in front of the platform. And after you've all come and stood, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You say, why do you ask people to come like this publicly? Because Jesus died on the cross publicly for you. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something, and every person in the New Testament that made their commitment with Jesus did it publicly. The only exception might have been Nicodemus when he came by night, but we don't know whether that's when he made his commitment or not. You get up and come with these people that are already coming. We're going to wait on you. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. You get up and come.
just as many hundreds tonight are responding here in the Georgia Dome to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can too, right where you are. Take a moment to call the number on your screen. If the lines are busy, just wait a moment and call back. We'll be here as long as the calls are coming in. We do want to help you. been listening to the message that has been given in song and in word. You heard about the blood that was dropping that Johnny Cash sang about. You've seen all these people that have come to the cross to find forgiveness of their sins and to find God's love. He'll come into your heart right now where you are. You may be in a hotel room or you may be at home. Just say yes to Christ in your heart. Say, Lord, I do turn from my sins with your help. I do receive you as my Lord and Master and Savior. I want to follow you in the fellowship of your church. You make that commitment. And then write to me, Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we'll send you the same literature we're going to give the people here. This is a book that we've worked on for years. It has everything in it. It has a part of the Word of God, the Gospel of John. It has scripture verses that you can tear out and carry in your pocket to memorize. It has Bible studies. It has a letter in there from me to you. We'll send it to you. Just write to me, Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's all the address you need. Or if you live in Canada, it's Billy Graham Post Office Box 841. Winnipeg, Manitoba. Write us and tell us that you made a commitment and we'll send you this book and this literature by return mail. God help you to do it.